praise the Lord. Actually, uh, I didn't have the volume all the way up. Amen. So it uh, was a good check, volume check. I may or may not delete that little 23 second video or sound check, but I don't like deleting anything that praises God or the Lord. Um, again, yesterday we have a, a, a bit of interesting conversation. Amen, Jesus. Father, forgive us. Um, regarding my sister uh, Nancy Tibbetts, and um, you know, unfortunately, it just seems that uh, no matter what you try to say or try to encourage someone else or to defend all right uh, there are just some people who take no matter what you have to say can wrong okay so you, you're never going to please everyone okay <laughs> and uh, the idea that you even make an effort is is foolish so I'm not I'm not going to uh, try to please everyone. I, I never really have <laughs> in the couple, two, three years that I've been out here. And uh, as a consequence of that, you are going to have some naysayers. <laughs> okay. And, uh, you know, it's just uh, from the ignorance that's, that's in us. And uh, that's really part of the issue that that we never really want to deal with. We never want to face the darkness in ourselves. You know, we think that once we ask Jesus into our heart and life to be our Lord and Savior, well then, you know, and, and, and receive the water baptism unto repentance, okay, and do all the fundamental doctrinal, okay, requirements, I guess, if you want to call them, uh, that uh, somehow or another all of that just magically goes away. <laughs> well, that hasn't been my uh, experience. Uh, as a matter of fact, as I had mentioned before in the earlier video, a couple years ago perhaps, um, According to the Word and, and my, my own experience, when a man turns away from unrighteousness and starts to walk into the path of righteousness, everything comes against him. <laughs> and, that in, and, and the things that come against us, I have found out, are the things that are in us. The darkness that is in us attract, I suppose, in some way, the darkness in the world. Every devil and every demon. Okay? Through other people and through the lust of the flesh and the work in, that has to be done in us. It, it all comes against okay, that the Spirit of Christ in us. So, uh, the seed of righteousness. Now we know that that seed, the Spirit of God in us, it's impossible for that man, the new man, to sin. That's what the Word says, that's the way it is. When you understand who the new man is, as the second Adam, all right, uh, then we'll understand why it's impossible for him to sin. So, um, but the outer man, he's still here, okay? And you've not yet been transformed, none of us have, into the likeness and the image of Jesus Christ. We've not established the Spirit of God in our lives. Uh, we've not learned how to, you know, turn away, nor have the strength to turn away from those things in us and around us. We're still attracted by the things in the world. 
We have these lusts in ourselves, uh, ignorances, darkness, prejudices, hatred, envy, strife. All of these things exist in us. So the first battleground, which is why I believe when the word says the kingdom of heaven is within, well, I don't think the kingdom of heaven is the only thing that's within. I believe that the darkness exists in us too. So the first battleground of which we need to deal with is in ourselves. The battle in the heavenlies, okay, in us. That's why putting to death the old man. And who is the old man? To me, the old man is the spirit of man that we're born in, the darkness and inequity of the fallen nature. I was reminded of a, a scripture this morning as I was meditating for a few minutes this morning uh, about the spirit lusts after the flesh and the flesh after the spirit. And it, that verse bothered me for, for the longest time because it just doesn't makes sense to me the way people explained it. I'm not sure if we could read that, amen Jesus, in a different light and see, amen Jesus, something different. At least I have come to learn to understand it differently now. Because what didn't make any sense to me is that it seemed as though they were talking about the Spirit of God. And I, I'm thinking, the Spirit of God? Lusting? After the flesh? Well, that just didn't make any sense to me. I, I just couldn't imagine the Spirit of God lusting after anything. Of course, now, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, <laughs> okay, <laughs> and uh, paranoid schizophrenics that we are, with all the other demons and spirits going on out here, and uh, and and sin that's passed down from generation to generation, and we'll talk about that too sometime. We have a little bit before, and I. I I shared with you, I've shared with you before that that was part of my story. Passed on from my great grandfather right on through my, my dad and to me on to the third and fourth generation of them who have turned away from God in their sin. And that's a very real experience. Turning away from God in your sin. And I've explained that and shared that with you before. How that opportunity showed itself to me and helped me to understand what took place obviously with my great grandfather regarding turning away from God in that sin. <laughs> so evidently someone, my great grandfather, believed in God but when it came to the lust of the flesh he turned away from his faith and followed on in to that sin. And it, I probably never repented. I don't know if he did or didn't. But at some time. Because I can tell you that took place for me because uh, that opportunity came. All right. But for me, by the grace of God, I had asked Jesus into my heart and life. So this battle, uh, which many of you may or may not understand nor believe, is that the law continues right until the end. And the law controls the actions of the outer man. It has nothing to do with the inner man, but it controls the actions of the outer man. And I don't care if you're a part of the uh, covenant, okay, of the Jews or not, because 
I think that that changed, amen, Jesus, so that when, just like when God uh, originally walked with that seed of faith, Israel, Jacob, Isaac, Abraham, amen, and established his kingdom here on earth through that ministry, Israel, and dwelt in that temple, all right, uh, when Jesus came, the light came out of the temple, the building, and in and among them, and went out into the world. And so when it says about the word, the light of the world. Okay, he became the light of the world. So salvation was offered to all mankind. But along with the light, of, all right, I believe the law of God began to operate, amen, Jesus, in the world. Now, prior to that, I'm sure there were a lot of issues for those outside of the covenant. There's, there's no question in my mind that to some degree, amen, Jesus, I just don't believe everybody on the earth, although the nature, our fallen nature, okay, uh, is present, amen, Jesus, uh, I guess I, what I'm trying to say is that I see that, uh, and I know that, that none are good, no, not one, okay. But based on based on uh, what I've seen in my life, I have seen men who seemingly did not have a faith in God, but yet lived good and just and moral lives. Uh, they cared for others. And uh, it always amazed me, and still does, how without the presence of God in their life, they're able to stand against the evil in this life and seemingly overcome it to go on to provide for their families and their homes. So that's a questionable area for me, but you get what I'm talking about. I don't. I just don't believe that everybody in the world, Amen, Jesus, uh, followed through uh, with the darkness that's inside of themselves. I, I, I believe we're all born with it, but for some reason or another. Some people just seem to know how to deal with, they have a greater amount of self-control. And, and uh, uh, they seem to uh, know, okay, are able to live within the societal realms or within the, the laws okay, of man, and uh, there are many laws uh, in this land and standards in a community that we, we come to learn, if you think about it, okay, uh, in the ancient of days, in ancient days, how, how civilizations learn to cooperate in their own little societies in order to operate and have a community that functioned for the good of the people that were in that society. Something had to be operating in and among them. All right? Now, in, that, in every society, you've always had people, well, they have religious desires or uh, to worship, uh, some believed in different types of gods, okay, and uh, like the Greeks, they had over a thousand different gods, I guess, <laughs> amen, uh, but 
uh, ancient man. I don't want to. I don't want to call him too ancient. I'm not talking about prehistoric man. I'm talking about uh, modern man, uh, in uh, uh, to the extent of which we have uh, historical pictures of different societies growing up around us. They weren't all all right. Praise God. Uh, worshiping the one and only true God. Yet their societies function. And they seem to have had some sort of a standard that they lived by in order for that society to function. Because it, any house divided against itself must fall. These are, these are eternal truths. So that's where I'm kind of coming from. All right. Uh, does the devil having give, been given authority okay because remember the temptation of Jesus uh, and the devil's claim that he had been given authority in this realm to give men to bless men to help men in order to bring havoc in their lives and I believe on, on the outer man now what was going on on the inside of them I have no idea but I'm just trying to establish a, 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 a uh, foundation I suppose uh, that helps me to understand better how the God of order and the one and only true God functioned in what the boundaries of the devil regarding man were. There, there has to be a conscious choice to choose to believe by faith in the one and only true God and or to not and to worship him and to not so my conclusion was that indeed the devil did have authority over that particular issue and as long as they remain children of the darkness there was no reason for the devil to bring havoc into their lives even if what they were doing at least on the surface and in their societies were what some people would call good good things they may have been uh, teachers they may have been artists they may have been uh, whatever the different things that you can be but as long as that society and that person remained a child of darkness he didn't have any problems. You following what I'm saying? Now he had, they lacked a certain amount of self-control. Uh, the laws of the society would, uh, you know, if they were thieves, you know, they had protection of property. They protected their property. It was uh, society cannot a society cannot last for very long if it does not have rules or regulations controlling that society so somebody came up with those ideas they didn't just come out of the blue all right somebody they only thought about this stuff uh, the elders of their particular tribes uh, set standards okay and their societies grew and now today we have what is known as the world and in the world okay there are people who are doing seemingly good things but yet they're still children of the darkness for me that's a very perplexing thought <laughs> Okay, <laughs> because if you took it on the moral ground that, and we know 
that none are genuinely good. In other words, the difference between God's true goodness and seeming superficial goodness, one that operates within the parameters of a, a, a society functioning, a functioning society, that type of good is not eternal. It, it could change at any moment. <laughs> I mean, a seemingly good man can snap and become a devil. <clears throat> and or a society. Hitler and uh, Germany. You know. I suppose that prior, I, we'd have to look into the German history, but prior to that period of time, I have to believe that the German people, like any other people, operated in a society of which there was seemingly good things being done, even though they weren't uh, children of the light. But it's superficial. It's not eternal. So when Jesus said, none are good, no, not one, but the Father, he is the only eternal good. Without shifting. <clears throat> so the offer of salvation was to the world. And I can understand that part of it because I, I remember one of the first things that I cried out to God about as a new believer was that I did not choose to be the way I was. Because I had some very serious character defects. Lust of the flesh. One of them. And uh, when I would cry out to God about that, I thought about that, and I think... What, what decision? What I would say, basically, what I would say. Listen, nobody asked me if I wanted to come down here to Earth and have to deal with this life. Nobody checked with me. And in a sense, that's absolutely true. One day we're just in the world, Amen. Jesus, born to this life as children, not knowing good or evil. All right. Yet the sentence of the curse has been placed upon us because of, of the sin of Adam, the original uh, parents of creation, I suppose you could say. Because of their fall, the nature of man, his spirit, was cast to the earth. And fellowship with God was broken. Yet God remained in the world. God's been around here. His, in, I don't believe, the light of God, because it wouldn't make sense. Uh, these are, if you're not prepared to, to go through a journey of uh, thinking these things out, and taking the time to reason, all right, through these things, then I can, I, I think you're blind. I, 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 even with your faith, all right, says the, the, the word, the word of God says that none are so blind as my servants. What? I'm walking in the light, I'm a servant of God. How? Can the word of God say, none are so blind as my servants? Now we can go off into a blind faith conversation. Okay? And that's basically what I'm talking about. Because people, some people, simply have a faith in God without any understanding or knowledge of God.
and then they pick up along the line, uh, along the way, in their so-called Christian faith, and I, and a faith in God is, you know, according to the word, all you need it, and your soul shall be saved. And I don't question that your soul shall be saved. But we spoke about this before. There are different rewards regarding our salvation. They're not all the same. So I want to go back to this blind faith thing, but I also want to stay connected to what we are in the process of attempting to do right now, which is to see and not be blind. See the truth for what it is. That, you know, that the light of God might shine forth from us. And until you see these things for what they are, you have no power or authority over them. That's, that's why he says, with knowledge gain understanding, and with understanding comes wisdom. This is the true arm of God. Not one that you vainly imagine in your mind, oh, you know, and you jump up and down, and, uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a warrior for God, i got a suit of armor. No, it's a literal spiritual process working from inside out that opens our eyes to the reality of the realm that we exist in, first of all, by our own self-examination and seeing man for who he is in our own selves, and then having the mercy and the compassion necessary to see that darkness in others, but love them anyway, because you yourself were once bound by those things, but now have you been set free? So when you look at your brother or you look at your sister and you see these faults, this darkness, that they have not had their eyes open to see the truth, all right, that they are still the blind servants of God, then we're required to have compassion upon them and help them to understand the truth. And I will tell you this, if they have no heart to actually do that, if they not consciously aware of the reality of that truth working in them, then it's going to be very hard to do it because it, I, I've tried. <laughs> it doesn't work very good. Uh, whatever little encouragement you might give them, even though they are subjected, uh, subjected to a, uh, a darkness in their life that they're not willing to face, might... My sister Nancy, I, I, you know, <clears throat> it takes one to know one. And if you have listened to Sister Nancy's story and all the chaos and confusion that's going on around her in her life, which she herself has often claimed, and then you see that we serve a God of order, then something's not right. Because you can't be in obedience to the leading of the Holy Spirit, having cut yourself off from the influences of the world, put to death the old man and crucified the flesh, and still live a life around you that's out of order. You can't do it. The whole point and the purpose of learning to overcome these things and to have power and authority over them is the growing of that light within us so that the inner man takes control over the outer man. And not only does he take control of the things on, uh, of the uh, man, but of the world around him. He has power and authority over them. The devil can no longer come in and create chaos. There's a hedge up around him by the power of the Holy Spirit. The same hedge of which, by the law, existed for naturalism and the outer man in the journey of that seed of faith. So, when I see these things going on with my brothers and sisters, and I offer to them that I know something has to be wrong, it's because 
there has to be an anchor to our souls. There has to be a, a, a city of refuge, a place of which we are finally at peace with God and man. That we, the, we've overcome these things, and now we walk with the full armor of God surrounding us. Which eliminates that chaos. And so now, when something does come, you see, it's not in it's not in the darkness. It can't just surprise us and catch us off guard, because the light is shining out forth from all around us, and our eyes have been opened to see, and we've come to learn the wiles of the devil, what his little tricks are, how he's able to come in through other people, through things that maybe hey. Oh, it's okay if I don't do this or do that. You know, they're unjust things, so I don't have to do them because they're unjust. <laughs> you see, what you're forgetting is that the devil has been given power and authority in this realm. And if you're a child of light, he's very much concerned about trying to destroy you. So the second you say, okay, well, he has no rule or reign in my life, but I'm, I'm seeing this law or this thing as unjust. It's still in the world, brother, and he still has power and authority. And the second you step out of what is right in even this world, he has a right to come in and punish you for it. He's been given power and authority. And you can't do a thing about it. And you will suffer the cost. That's why the word says, <laughs> make peace with that judge, or make peace with the, uh, the uh, what is it, the officer, before you are taken up to the judge. So he's got his little minions out here, the officers, just waiting to see us do something that consciously... I don't care how you get around it. As you're a natural man, you have the natural body. You still have the natural mind, even though you may have authority over all of those cardinal ideas and thoughts. You are still a natural man. And if you are consciously aware of something wrong that you have done that was not right, you are looking to face the judge. You can't get rid of it. And ultimately you will get turned over to the judge and you will suffer payment. And according to the word of God, you will stay in that judgment, locked up, until you've paid every penny. The fiery trials. <laughs> okay. You have to trust God to allow yourself to go through them, dealing with the issues of what you have done wrong, needing to face life on life's terms. In other words, face the devil and the world around you on their terms. Regardless of whether or not you think it's just or not just, regardless of if you think it's right, it has nothing to do with what we think. Come to agreement with the officer before he take you up to the judge. We're kept safe by the power of God because our eyes are open to see the truth of the realm of which we exist in. Not because it's some kind of a magic trick Oh, I believe in Jesus, therefore I'm protected. Forget that. <laughs> that ain't going to work for you. I guarantee it won't work for you. Why do you think my people die daily for the lack of knowledge, yet how is it that his people die daily from the lack of knowledge when they study the Word of God? Because they have no understanding of what they've studied. They've gained no wisdom. 
So the knowledge puffs them up. Well, verify. There is, and then I have people who will, in the Jesus, ah, praise God, come after me on little comments and things. And some of the time, I, I, the ignorance is so terrible, uh, it's so plain, I, I really don't even bother to answer them back because, you know, <laughs> if you answer a fool according to its foolishness, then you're going to receive a stripe, uh, uh, a whipping for it and uh, just, you know, for doing it. Uh, it's, some things are just better not to get involved with when you see that. Okay. They all just, out of the blue, like uh, what took place the other day, I made uh, a video uh, talking about my sister Nancy and regarding the stammering lips, which somehow or another, I guess that's a bad thing. <laughs> it's, it brings honor and glory to God uh, every time each one of us are, 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 are coming into a greater light. But um, what I mentioned uh, earlier about uh, my sister Nancy and I have shared with her before that it takes one to know one. Uh, it's my belief that Sister Nancy is the uh, unrecovered alcoholic. And as an alcoholic, she tends to be a perfectionist. And you cannot please a perfectionist. The perfectionists cannot please themselves. So they live in a very, very world. They're spun. They're wound up. Everything's chaos around them. They don't see anything. They, uh, they don't, uh, you know, they just learn to live in that condition. There's no peace in their lives. And until she takes the time to go get some help from others like myself, who have learned to overcome the drink, and it's not just the actual act of the drinking, and that's where many of us, because we're blind servants, have not seen the truth regarding certain things and aspects of addictions and different, we're going to talk about them all, and I'm going to show you the Lord, amen, Jesus, I pray, begins to start to open up the eyes of the blinded servants. So they might see the truth of the reality of which they live in and then be given the power, okay, to overcome them. But if, until you see them, until you see the truth of it and you find that root and understand how to deal with it, it will rule your life and the devil will have control and he'll be able to come in and do whatever he wants whenever he wants to do it. But you've got to be able to put a stop to it. And the way you put a stop to it is by seeing the truth. So don't hide from it. And that's what most of us do. We want to hide from it and pretend like it's going to go away, but it's not going to go away. Until you realize, just like I had to realize, that I needed someone else's help to help me to see the truth of the darkness in me. So I don't want to spend too much time. I just wanted to share a little bit with you. And, and uh, I pray to God that we're able to continue. Amen. Jesus, thank you, Father, in this vein of thought and understanding. And uh, I pray that some of you might have received some benefit from it and that in the future that you might receive more benefit from it. I hope that you begin to start to see and understand that there is so much more hidden of which has not been revealed which will now begin to start to be revealed to the blind servant that they might see. The arising and the awakening is about to take place. So, the Lord uh, be with you and bless you in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Father. Amen.